Good morning. This is John Hesse, Cahoka Presbyterian Church. Glad to have you following along um, as we read from Luke's Gospel, and, and we'll be reading from the other Gospel accounts as well. But we'll be reading from Luke 22, verses 31 through 71. Uh, that's a rather lengthy passage, so we won't go in, in depth with anything, but we will compare these different passages. Now, uh, the title of the message is Tested, because it's the testing that Jesus went through, and it's the testing that he went through on our behalf. And none of us look forward to tests in school. I know I certainly didn't. But what is the purpose of a test? No, it's not to make students miserable, although you might think that when you're a student. But actually for the, I've been a student and I've been a teacher both. And for a teacher, the purpose of a test is to find out exactly what they, they learned. Because if they didn't learn anything, then you might have an entire classroom full of people who don't understand anything, or more likely, you're not doing a really good job of explaining it. So tests are both for the benefit of the student, so that the student can know what he or she has learned, and for the benefit of the teacher. All right, before we read, I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that we remember the testing that you went through on our behalf. And we thank you that you use your word to test, to try, to reveal the thoughts and attitudes of our own hearts. And we ask that you would help us to submit ourselves to that testing, to recognize those things that are there, to receive your encouragement, to receive your correction, to receive your hope. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Now, I'll be reading primarily from Luke's Gospel, but I'll be referring to all of the other Gospels. Um, one of the things that can be, that I'll be attempting, and attempting is a key word, to put this together in, in something approaching a chronological fashion. Now, what, what you have in the four Gospels are four eyewitness accounts of these events that happened. And if you ever deal with eyewitness accounts of anything, no two agree completely on everything. There's an obvious reason for that. If two people see the same thing, they'll notice different things. Many times we'll be driving down the road and my wife will point something out and being a little slow at times, I don't necessarily see what she saw. I see something, but what I notice isn't necessarily what she noticed. And what she noticed isn't necessarily what I noticed. You have four different eyewitnesses. Each one notices different things. So each gospel will bring out different things that that particular eyewitness observed. And so um, <clears throat> the challenge, uh, in, in, and uh, is in terms of putting it together chronologically, is to try to figure, okay, where does this connect with this? And where does this connect with that? Uh, this may not be accurate, but you know, I, I, I've tried to follow as, as much as I can the, uh, the timeline that would have happened. Okay, Luke 22, <clears throat> verses 31 through 71. We, we won't read it all at one time. And the Lord said... Now, this is after the disciples have been arguing as to which one is the greatest. And then Jesus has come in and washed their feet. That's recounted in John's gospel. Um, showing an example of the attitude that he wanted his disciples to have then and now. And an attitude of serving others. Uh, many times the best teaching is an example that we see, not words that we hear. Um, and so he shows them that example. And the Lord said, Luke twenty two thirty one, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. 
But he, Peter, said to him, Jesus, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. In verse 31, Peter is, Satan, boy, I'm really messing this up. Jesus is telling Peter that Satan has asked for him. Now, ask is, is, uh, is to demand for trial, to claim back for trial. We, we would use the term extradition. Uh, suppose I'd robbed a bank in Oklahoma. That, that didn't happen, but suppose I had. And I got pulled over for speeding in Missouri, and, and the officer was checking my history and found out, hmm, this guy is wanted for bank robbery in Oklahoma. Well, after I went to trial for speeding in Missouri, the state of Oklahoma would want me back, would extradite me for trial for bank robbery. So <clears throat> Jesus is saying to Peter that Satan has made that claim, that extradition claim. And that is the only authority, actually, that Satan has on a believer. Um, I, I don't know if most of us re recognize that, but the authority that Satan has is the authority of an accuser, a prosecuting attorney. He cannot, he cannot destroy us himself, much as he would want to. He cannot. What he can do and does do is bring our sins up to the righteous and holy judge, hoping to receive um, that judgment upon us, to, to destroy us in that manner. Um, and so, <clears throat> now, if I were Peter, I would have been tempted to say when Jesus said that, uh, you told him no, didn't you? Surely you told him no. But Jesus didn't tell him no. He said, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Now, you, he's speaking to Peter, but the you is plural. So if this was written in Southern English, it would be, I have prayed for you all. He's speaking to, you know, I have, I have prayed for all of you disciples, not just Peter, not just John individually, but every one of you, including us. He's prayed for all of us that your faith should not fail. And when you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. To strengthen, uh, Dr. Luke uses this term, and it's appropriate because to strengthen is literally the term that is used to set a broken bone so that it heals not only as strong as it was before, but actually stronger. I have heard, I've, I've never experienced this myself, thankfully. I've never experienced a broken bone myself. But I, I have been told by those who have that if you do have a broken bone, chances are virtually nil that you'll have a broken bone in exactly the same place because when it, when it is properly set and mended, it's stronger than it originally was. Now, it may break close to that, but it won't break in the same place. So he's saying that, that when Peter returns, when he is mended, he will be stronger than he was. Um. <clears throat> In 1 Peter 5, verse 8, and, and Peter is writing this decades later to the church. He's referring to the, uh, because he's experienced this himself, he, he's writing to the church to be on guard against the attacks of Satan or the evil one. In 1 Peter 5, verse 8, be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Something else I heard. Again, I, I have zero experience with lions. But I, I have heard that the lion that roars is not the lion that kills you. The lion that roars uh, <clears throat> is the lion that is there to scare you to drive you into the hungry mouths of the waiting lionesses that are waiting to devour their prey. Um, so Satan is like that roaring lion seeking whom he may devour to drive us, trying to drive us into that sin that would, in fact, drive, uh, consume us. 
And in Revelation 12, verses 10 and 11, in John's vision, he sees in the future Satan, who is described as the accuser of the brethren, being cast into the lake of fire. In Psalm 51, 10 through 13, this is David's prayer of contrition um, after he's been confronted by Nathan for his murder and adultery. And he prays for restoration, and he uses a similar term in terms of being strengthened. Psalm 51, 10 through 13. We don't know what, what Peter cried out and when he prayed after his denial of the Lord, but it is certainly quite possible that he would have prayed something very similar to this or maybe even this itself. Psalm 51, 10 through 13. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. That's a very similar word in Hebrew, restore. And uphold me by your generous spirit. And here's the promise. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. When that restoration takes place, then that is fulfilled. You see, in John 21, 15 through 17, you see that process of restoration. And, and I, I won't read that, but I do encourage you to read that on your own. Where Jesus appears to his disciples, <clears throat> and he speaks specifically to Peter, and he asks him three times, do you love me? He gives Peter the chance to affirm him for every time that he's denied him. Peter denied the Lord three times, and three times Jesus gives him the opportunity to affirm his love for him. In Acts 2.14, again, I encourage you to read that on your own, the entire chapter, actually. But you see the, the restoration there, really fulfilled. Because this same Peter, who less than two months before had denied the Lord, is standing in front of a hostile crowd, boldly proclaiming that Jesus, that the Jesus whom they crucified, is the savior of mankind and the one in whom they and we need to trust in for forgiveness of sins. You see a, a radical change of a restoration, a strengthening from that bone that was broken and has been properly set by Jesus' restoration and is stronger, much stronger than it was before. And Jesus is saying to the disciples, I have prayed for you. You, you catch some glimpses of that in the 17th chapter of John. And the entire 17th chapter of John is a prayer of Jesus for his disciples. But I would like to point out a few verses specifically. Verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Verse 11, now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those you have given me. And verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. That Jesus is praying for Peter, Jesus is praying for them, and Jesus was and is praying for us to keep us from being deceived and overwhelmed and swallowed up by the evil one. Amen. Going on. Verse 35. And he, Jesus, said to them, When I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you like anything? So they said, Nothing. Then he said to them, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that that which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. 
Now, <clears throat> Jesus is quoting there when he says, he was numbered with the transgressors. He's quoting from Isaiah 53, verse 12. I, I encourage you to read Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 12. It's a powerful, very specific prophetic picture of Jesus as the suffering servant who came to bear our sins upon himself. But I, w I would like to point out a couple of things in here. Um, and one is in verse 38, where he tells them that, that, that he who has no sword, sell and, and get a sword. And so they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said, it is enough. Now, I have a question. Now, Jesus knew, although the disciples probably didn't, that an armed group of soldiers was coming after Jesus. So, if they were going to de depend on their swords, would two swords be enough? Absolutely not. The point is not that they had enough swords to fight off somebody who was coming to take their master. The point is that they did have some means they had some physical means of resistance uh, again jesus is showing that he's not a victim he's a sacrifice there's a big difference a, a, a victim doesn't get to choose a victim is someone who is overtaken by superior force and harmed or brutalized or killed a sacrifice is someone who willingly lays down his or her life whether in part or in full for the benefit of someone else <clears throat> and and so the point was not that they had enough swords to fight off someone who was coming against them the point is that they had some physical means to resist which you know, later on peter does try to use and and jesus tells him to put his sword away um, the point is not that they had a large number the point is that they had some they had enough to be numbered with the transgressors 39 through 46 coming out he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed and his disciples also followed him when he came to that place he said to them pray that you may not enter into temptation and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he arose from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Now, Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46, and Mark 14, verses 32 through 42 are parallel accounts of this, and, and I encourage you to read those on your own. But I would like to point out one thing in Luke uh, Luke's gospel in verse 39, he went out to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed. In Luke 21, 37, it says, In the daytime he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and stayed on the mountain called Olivet. So his disciples, including Judas, knew that that's where he was used to going of an evening. Also, in John's Gospel, John chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. When Jesus had spoken these words, praying for his disciples, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas didn't have to go looking for Jesus. He knew where he would find him because they met there on a regular basis. They'd been meeting there every night <clears throat> ever since Jesus had come into the city. <clears throat> Reading on. 
Oh, okay. In verse 41, it says, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. And uh, verse 42, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That was characteristic of Jesus' entire earthly life and ministry. Now, in Luke 18, 10 through 14, Jesus tells a parable in which you have contrasting prayers. And I think he, I believe he tells it to the scribes and the Pharisees and the disciples so that they understand the difference between prayers that God pays attention to and prayers that God doesn't. Now, some might think, well, God pays attention to all prayers. No, God doesn't pay attention to all prayers. That may sound shocking, but God knows our hearts. And he's really not interested in insincere prayers. Just, just as human beings, we're not really interested in, in what somebody has to say if, if we know for a fact that they're just saying something to flatter us. There's, there's no point in listening to what they have to say. You know, to reach way back, for those who remember this, in the old Leave it to Beaver show, now, Eddie always said nice things to Mr. and Mrs. Cleaver, but they were smart enough not to pay much attention to him because they knew that Eddie Haskell was a flatterer and he really had no interest in, in uh, what they wanted. <laughs> he was just interested in what he wanted and could possibly get out of them. Um, Jesus tells the parable in Luke 18, 10 through 14 of the Pharisee and the tax collector and the Pharisee prays this beautiful prayer thanking God for not making them like all those scumbags that were around and, and basically just praising himself. The Pharisee, or the, the tax collector, on the other hand, would not look up to heaven but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said that the tax collector went home justified and not the Pharisee, that God was looking at the heart of the tax collector. And he was looking at the heart of the Pharisee and seeing that the, the Pharisee's heart was not really interested in praising God, but in praising himself. But Jesus prays in complete submission to the will of the Father, just as he's lived his entire life. In John 4, 34, and in John, I'll, I'll be reading, I'll, I'll be pointing to several references from John's gospel. In John 4, 34, and in John 5, 30, Jesus speaks of being submitted to the will of the Father. I'd like to read from John chapter 6, verses 38 through 40. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That is the hope that no other founder of an organized religion can make. I mean, there are, there are many sincere followers of Buddha, there are many sincere followers of Muhammad. There are many sincere followers of any religion you can name. But not one of them could say, he who believes in me, I will raise him up at the last day. They didn't have that power. They couldn't raise themselves up, let alone their followers. Uh, Jesus could and did make that claim. In John 8, 28 and 29, again, Jesus is speaking of Fulfilling the will of the Father. John 8, 28 and 29. Then Jesus said to them, <coughs> to his disciples, and this is a mixed crowd. His disciples are there. The scribes and the Pharisees are there. There are people there who love him. There are people there who hate him. Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. And that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I 
always do those things that please him. Again, that's something that only Jesus can say. Not one of us can say, I always do the things that please the Father. I mean, if we've been born from above, uh, above, we desire to do those things that please the Father, but we recognize that we don't always do the things that please the Father. Um, but Jesus could say that because it was true of him. In Isaiah 50, verse 5 and 6, you have a prophecy of the servant who is to come. Um, I mean, Isaiah is prophesying hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Isaiah 50, verses 5 and 6. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. Jesus did not turn away from the sacrifice he was called to make on our behalf. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and from spitting. Reading on. In verse 43, it says, An angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, as Jesus is praying. You have another example of angels coming to minister to Jesus after his temptation in the wilderness by Satan. <clears throat> in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 11, it says that after Jesus had finished these trials, that angels came and ministered to him. They strengthened him because he was very weak from 40 days without food and going through the, uh, not, not only the physical exhaustion, but the incredible spiritual battle he had gone through in that trial and temptation. Verse 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. In John chapter 12, verses 23 through 28, Jesus is prophesying of what he is going to go through. This is before that. This is before the Last Supper. John chapter 12, verses 23 through 28. But Jesus answered them, his disciples, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, most of us, if we hear, you know, if we're followers of somebody and, said, and he says the Son of Man will be glorified, they're probably thinking, great, we've been following him for three years, three and a half years, and finally he's going he's gonna to show his power and he's going to rule and reign. He's going to throw out the Romans and everything's going to be wonderful. Maybe I'll sit on the right hand or, and maybe you'll sit on the left hand, but, you know, we'll argue about that later if, if we don't argue about it now. Then Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, my father will honor. Him my father will honor. Now my soul will is troubled and what shall I say father save me from this hour this is pretty much the same thing that he's praying later in the garden but for this purpose I came to this hour father glorify your name so Jesus is praying <clears throat> in this time as he later prays in the garden my will be done he's praying for the strength to fulfill what he knows the father wants him to do the if that he uses here, if it is your will. It's, it's not the if of questioning. Jesus knows what the will of the Father is. It's the, it's the if of recognizing and surrendering his will and his desires to the will of the Father. Jesus was tempted in every way like we are, but without sin. Temptation is not the same as sin. The devil intends for temptation to lead to sin, but temptation in and of itself is not sin. It can be exhausting. It can be brut brutal, and it can be uh, really difficult. But <clears throat> unless we give in to it, it is not sin. And Jesus never did give in to that temptation. It's the if. It's the condition of surrendering himself to that. In Hebrews 5, 
5 through 7, the writer of the, of the <coughs> letter to the Hebrews is pointing out the supremacy of Jesus as a high priest compared to all of the earthly high priests that ever were. Hebrews 5, verses 5 through 7. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he, the Father, who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, because he completely and totally submitted himself to the will of the Father, regardless of the cost. Then it goes on to say in verse 46, he says to the disciples, why do you sleep? You have another example, and a much more glorious example, when the disciples in exhaustion had fallen asleep. In Luke 9, 32, during the transfiguration, Jesus had gone with some of his disciples to the mountaintop to pray, and they had become exhausted and fallen asleep, and, and he had to wake them up so that they could see his glory, <coughs> the, the glory that the Father, the glory that he had come from. And the glory, intent, the, the glory that the Father intended for them to see. Because they were going to need the knowledge of that glory. Because they and we were going to go through suffering. Now we may not have to go through the same suffering that they did. I sincerely hope not. But, but we need to see, we need to recognize his glory. The glory that he has for those that are his. The glory that is a heavenly glory. But they'd fallen asleep, so he had to wake up, wake them up. And then he says, rise and pray. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, to be watchful, to be alert. In Ephesians 6, 18, and that's part of a section in which um, Paul is writing to the Ephesians, and he's comparing our life to a battle. Now, that's not a pleasant analogy, but if you know you're going into battle, you want to put on your armor. Well, in, in those days, he used the, the analogy of uh, a Roman's soldier's army, and he uses those pieces, the breastplate and so forth. In modern parlance, you'd probably use a Kevlar helmet and a bulletproof vest if somebody's going to be shooting at you because, well, you want to stay alive. <laughs> and now that's not something you wear for comfort if you don't expect that to happen. Oh, it's a nice, it's a nice sunny day, you know, it's, it's a hot day. Yeah, and so I'm going to put on this 15-pound vest on this hot day and walk around. I, I don't think so. But if you know that somebody's planning to try to kill you, then you'll gladly welcome the weight of that 15-pound pound vest, uh, even though it makes you hotter, and that Kevlar helmet, <laughs> because it increases your chances of survival substantially. Um, well, God's armor is much better than human armor. It doesn't just increase our chances of survival. If we put on God's armor, then it makes it a sure thing. Um, so he's using that in terms of speaking of watchfulness. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, and that's part of a, a, a section of brief verses, verses 15 through 22 that I'd like to look at. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15 through 22. Again, he's speaking of watchfulness. And he says, See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So we are commanded to be vigilant, to keep watch to rise and pray, as Jesus told his disciples. Going on in Luke's gospel, the betrayal and the arrest. And <clears throat> there are three parallel passages that I'll refer to portions of. Uh, Luke 
chapter 22, 47 through 53, which I'll be reading. Matthew 26, 47 through 56. Mark chapter 14, verses 43 through 52. And John chapter 18, verses 3 through 11. While he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Now, in Matthew's gospel, at this point, in verse 50, Jesus speaks to Judas, and he calls him, of all things, friend. Now, do you think that Jesus was saying that sarcastically? No. I, I, I really don't believe so. It, it is not the desire of God that anyone should perish. People do perish. People choose to perish. He, he does not force anyone to submit to his will. He does not force anyone to come to him for salvation. But it was not the will of the Father. It was not the will of Jesus for Judas to perish eternally it was necessary for the fulfillment of prophecy for Judas to betray Jesus but Jesus is giving Judas still another chance to repent because Judas has done his job he has pointed out Jesus to the crowd that wants him he has fulfilled what he would have had to have done to fulfill the prophecy he could have chosen to repent, but in, instead he chose to go through with it, was filled with remorse, went out and committed suicide. Um, but Jesus is, is calling Judas a friend because he loves him. He wants him to respond to the kindness that he's being shown, even in this act of betrayal. He wants him to respond with repentance and faith and <clears throat> it's impossible for us to understand the kindness and the, the compassion of God even when we walk away from him even when we deny him his kindness and compassion he is a holy God and, and if we continually refuse to respond to his kindness and his compassion we, we are left with nothing but to face the consequences of our refusal but he doesn't give up on us easily. In Judas' case, he didn't give up on even when Judas was betraying him into the hands of his enemies. He called him friend. Now, I, I would like to read from John 18, 3 through 11, because you have something that only John's gospel inserts that shows again that Jesus was not a victim. He was a sacrifice. Then Judas having received a detachment, a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, that would give you pause to consider. I mean, you come out with what appears to be overwhelming force to take a pitiful band of, of disciples with a pitiful two swords. And the, the leader comes forward and says, I am he, and everybody falls back to the ground. They can't stand up. They answered him, oh, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. Jesus is showing that he is going of his own accord. He is also providing for the protection of his disciples. He's saying there doesn't need to be a battle. If you want to talk about overwhelming force, the overwhelming force is with Jesus. He just has to say a word and they can't move. But he goes with them willingly as a sacrifice. That the scripture might be fulfilled which he spoke, of those whom you gave me I have lost none. 
Then Simon Peter, having a sword, <coughs> drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? So Jesus is showing again that he is going of his own accord as a willing sacrifice and not a victim. Then back to Luke's gospel. When those around him, and this is a parallel here, when those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. I, I think maybe Luke was being kind and not naming Peter. <laughs> is the one who cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Again, Dr. Luke is, is the one who includes that detail. And as a doctor, it makes sense that he would be really interested in this, that even in the midst of being arrested, of being betrayed, that Jesus shows his compassion by touching and healing the ear of one of those who's come after him. Then Jesus said to the high priest, I'm sorry, the chief priest, captain to the temple, and the elders who had come against him. Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then verses 54 through 62. Um, <clears throat> I'll just read from Luke's gospel. Again, there are parallel accounts in the other Gospels, and, and we'll refer to some of those things as we kind of go along. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house, but Peter followed at a distance. Now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him, but he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. After a little while, another saw him and said, You also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And the Galileans had a different accent, and you find that out in one of the other Gospels where it says your, your accent betrays you. Uh, Chances are pretty good that if you grew up in Mississippi and, and you went to visit somebody in Minnesota, they'd probably be able to tell really, really quickly that you weren't from there. Um, or vice versa. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. <clears throat> Previously, Peter had said, I'm willing to die with you. And to kind of give proof to it, he'd drawn his sword to try to cut off, you know, to, well, I'm sure he wasn't trying to cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. I'm, I'm sure he had a more lethal meant, uh, end for that sword than cutting off somebody's ear. But he was a fisherman. He wasn't a trained soldier. Um, you know, he probably had a lot of experience filleting fish, but not with uh, using a sword for combat. <clears throat> and P and, and uh, Jesus had told him to put his sword away. Peter probably would have been willing to die uh, fighting for the Lord. I mean, he was, he was impetuous, and in a lot of ways, he was a very brave man. But it's, it's one thing in our human strength to die what would be seen as a glorious, heroic death. It's another thing to be willing to die the most horrible death imaginable that had been perfected by the Romans, um, to die not as a hero, but as a criminal, and the worst kind of a criminal. Um, and so Peter responded to that fear, and he, he denied the Lord. And then at some point while he was still speaking, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now, in one of the Gospels, it tells that Peter, uh, sorry, not that Peter, that Jesus was being 
transported from one house to another. So that is probably the point at which he passed through the courtyard and saw Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord. In Matthew 26, 34 and 35, in Mark 14, 30 and 31, and in John 13, 37 and 38, you have the prophecy given by Jesus to Peter that he would deny him three times. So Peter is remembering that with great remorse. Then reading on. Now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. And having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. In Isaiah 50, verse 6, and we read that earlier, it, it speaks of having his beard plucked out, being spit upon, things that he, he was willing to go through. Uh, again, as a sacrifice, not a victim. As a willing sacrifice. <clears throat> In Mark 14, 65, is a parallel account of, of that being beaten before his trial. Verse 66 through 71, he's tried by the Sanhedrin. As soon as it was day. Now, this is the first trial that has any semblance of legality because under Jewish law, you couldn't try somebody at night. So he had been questioned previously in the high priest's house, but that was an illegal trial. They were not allowed by the law to have a trial at that time. But here, as soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. In Mark 14, verses 55 through 65, <clears throat> is a parallel account. And in this parallel account, uh, the Sanhedrin are looking, they hired some false witnesses to give testimony, and they can't get their testimony to agree, even when they twist the words that Jesus had previously said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Speaking of his resurrection, they still can't get that straight. Um, but he uses that term, and, and they use that as part of their charge of blasphemy. In John chapter 18, verses 19 through 24, John gives more details of this particular trial. John 18, 19 through 24. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet, and in secret I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they have knowledge what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So you have more details there. And... <clears throat> There's kind of a similar line of questioning uh, in Luke's gospel, chapter 20, verses 1 through 8. You have a, a situation where the scribes and the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus in his words. And it happened on one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, that the chief priests and the scribes, together with the elders, confronted him and spoke to him, saying, Tell us. By what authority are you doing these things? Or who is he who gave you this authority? They're asking him that question. Is it because they care about his answer? Because they're willing to submit themselves to his authority if, if he can show his authority? No, they really aren't. And he knows that. 
and it, it's it's basically the same question when he's in front of the high in front of the uh, council in the high priest's house. You know, what authority do you have to say these things? But he answered them. He answered and said to them, I will also ask you one thing and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us. But they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it was from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. That's the difference, just to point something, the difference between doubt and unbelief. God is a merciful and compassionate and loving God, and he is not afraid of our doubt. If we struggle with doubt and we don't know the answer to something and we go to him wanting to know the answer, sometimes he'll tell us the answer. Sometimes you'll just tell us, trust in me, and you'll see the answer at some point. But we do not offend God by bringing our doubts to him. Unbelief, on the other hand, is it may look like doubt, but unbelief is an unwillingness to submit ourselves to the answer. They're asking Jesus a question they're not the least bit interested in the answer to unless they can use it to accuse him. I mean, he could say to them, my authority is from the Father. But they're not willing to submit themselves to it, even, even if they see miracles to prove it, even if they have heard the message, even if they see him raise the dead. They're not willing to submit themselves to his authority that he's from the Father, even though he, even though he can show them prophecy. And so <clears throat> he doesn't answer their question because they're really not willing to listen to the answer now does that mean that that's the answer we should that the attitude we should take well generally I would say no and the reason is that we can't read somebody else's heart we can't we can't really know if somebody is expressing doubt or unbelief now we may strongly suspect it's unbelief especially if they've been presented with the truth and have a sturdy refusal to listen to the truth but we, we are not the Holy Spirit. And Jesus could read their hearts and their minds. He could know exactly what they were thinking. He could know exactly that they were unwilling to listen, that they were unwilling to submit to him, regardless of the truth. But he does go on to say in verse 69 that you will see hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Now, that was an unmistakable thing. That refers back to Daniel and Daniel's vision where he sees the Son of Man sitting, the Messiah sitting on the right hand of God. The, the author of the Hebrews refers to this a couple of places. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3, and Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. But the right hand was and still is in, in countries that have royalty. It's a position of authority and power. And it was since ancient times when Joseph interpreted the Pharaoh's dream. He was set on the Pharaoh's right hand. That was a position of authority. Daniel was promoted to the right hand of the king of Babylon. In both, play, both cases, godly men because of their excellent character and their faithfulness to the word of God, were promoted to positions of second in command, not to godly kings, but to godless, wicked kings. They had places of great authority and power, and they were able to be used as a blessing to those who were faithful to God, even in the midst of a godless culture. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory 
and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high in Hebrews 8 1 and 2 now the main point of the things we are saying now this is the main point of the things we are saying we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man now the writer of the Hebrews in this is pointing out something that that the Jewish readers of his time would have understood uh, us we live in a vastly different culture and so we don't so much understand it but under ancient Jewish law the high priest and the king were entirely different people the king was not to serve as a high priest and the high priest was not to serve as king now he could be and in the case of godly kings the high priest was an advisor to the king and a wise king would pay heed to the godly advice of a godly high priest but they were not one and the same except in the case of the Messiah it was prophesied that the eternal son of David the Messiah would be both king and high priest now the confusion occurred with the early disciples when they were expecting Jesus as the Messiah to assume both rule both roles at the same time he came as high priest he offered himself as the perfect sacrifice for our sins he made it possible for us to have access to the father he's coming again as king and the, the authority of the king is is to rule to reign to punish uh, the evildoers and he's delaying his coming because he desires more to come to him to receive him as Savior and as Lord father we thank you so much that we can trust in you now as our faithful high priest the one who has made atonement with your own blood for our sins and then if we trust in you if we submit ourselves to your authority and recognize you as Savior and as Lord that you are those things we also recognize you as our king the one who will come in power that no one can resist who will make all things right and we rejoice in that hope and we thank you so much for calling us to yourself in Jesus name amen and thank you very much God bless you